Good evening, Mission Church. It is so good uh, to be with you this evening. Never take it lightly uh, to be able to uh, proclaim God's good news uh, to a dying world, uh, to encourage the saints and to equip them. And so uh, we would be remiss if we don't go to God in prayer, because if he doesn't speak, what is the point of us being here? And so, Lord, as we open up your word, would your spirit uh, do the work of illumination? God, let us be faithful to the text, but God, let us see you rightly. God, to honor, to cherish, to, to behold your beauty. Lord, and as we do that, as we sit at your feet, God, would we hear your words. Let us ever be so sensitive, God, to, to listen and to obey. God, whatever you say, let's take it at face value. God, and we'll do what you, you said us to do. God, and we're here longing for your word, longing for your healing, longing for your restoration, longing for your revival. God, do what only you can do. God, those who came in broken, God, we know that you're a healer. God, those who came uh, with so much despair, God, you have the hope of your gospel. Those who are in torment, God, the peace of your good news is available to them. And so, God, I pray that we would be able to partake of your goodness and your mercy. Your name be the praise. Your name be the glory. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. amen. Uh, we are going to be in the book of Luke, so Luke chapter 10, and where we'll find ourselves at the end of chapter 10 is we will be in the house of Mary and Martha with Jesus. And verse 38 reads, Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha, somebody say but was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care my sister has left me alone to serve? That's bold. Coming to Jesus, I know you teach him, but can you get my sister? I need her for a second in the kitchen. <laughs> and he says, Lord, do you not care? She says, do you not care my sister has left me alone to serve? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha. You are anxious and troubled about many things. But one thing, one thing, one thing, just one. One thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. So if I could have, you know, a little tagline for you to remember what we talk about today is take a seat. Can you turn to your neighbor and maybe they'll sink in if you verbally process it. Just say, take a seat. Take a seat. You know, sometimes after a long day, you just need to sit back, let your feet relax. My dad used to say, my dogs are barking. I need to let them go and have a seat. Um, and so uh, as we consider Jesus today, I pray that you would hear his invitation to sit at his feet. So I have a confession. I deal with... Um, over choice, or some might call it uh, choice overload. And really what it is, it's a feeling of being overwhelmed when you're presented with so many different options. It's something that I kind of experience op often. Take, for example, you're at a restaurant. Do not come to me first. I don't know what I want, okay? <laughs> I don't care how long it's been, I still don't know. Uh, everybody else has ordered the menu. See, I have a problem of like, well, I don't want to order what they ordered. I want something different. I don't know what I'm in the mood for. And what, what if I want to try something new or should I keep it simple? Am I, you know, in the mood for something spicy or mild? Am I in the mood for something cold or something hot? I don't know. But these are the questions that I ask myself every single time uh, when we go to the restaurant. So no, my answer is I am not ready. Uh, it'd be great if you just choose for me. Um, it's actually the best thing uh, being married because I don't, just have, I don't just have one option anymore, I have two. There's two plates that I get to pick from, hallelujah. Um, and no longer are my options so limited, because what if I make the wrong decision? What if I get something and I don't like it? Well, at least I have one more plate to pick from. So if anybody, anybody likes family style dinner, here I am, hallelujah. Well, it's the same thing. It doesn't just happen with food. How, how, where are my shoppers at? Anybody, you just love to shop? 
Yeah, t come on, tell the truth and shame the devil. Yeah, love to shop. Well, I too love to, uh, well, I don't really love to shop, but we can probably spend the same amount of time. You can go into the store, go into Target, for example, and you're like, I just want one thing. We'll both go in there with the intention of one thing. Two hours later, how many, do you leave with one thing? Never. Me, on the other hand, I do, because it takes that long to make a decision. I kid you not. What? <laughs> thanks, thanks, babe. Um, I kid you not, there was one time I was in the store at Safeway, but I wasn't in the store for an hour and a half. I was in one aisle for an hour and a half because I wanted to pick the right birthday card. I wanted, I wanted, I wanted Hallmark to get it right. I wanted something that was uh, faithfully inspired, but yet funny. It knew, you know, their particular quirks. It just, it just takes me, I need to make the right decision. Toothpaste, the same thing. Do I want something that's whitening? Do I want something that kills bad breath? Do I want something that helps protect the enamel? I mean, there's just so many options and I don't, I want to make sure I pick the right one. Now, with these frivolous things, what does it matter? I order the wrong meal and don't like what I'm paying, even though I probably at now, you know, I'm 50 bucks out of my pocket because there's no cheap meals anymore. Um, <laughs> or brush my teeth, I don't like the toothpaste, I can go back to the store, life goes on, all right? The issue becomes, and here in our text, there is the decision that the text presents to us that yeah. if you don't choose rightly, it is actually a matter of life and death. Yeah. Not a matter of preference, but yes. a matter of priority. Yes. So here, the decision we see in Luke 10 is on a whole different level. We have two sisters in the same house with Jesus, but they're having two totally different experiences. One is being described as anxious and troubled with many things, and while the other is sitting at the feet of Jesus, fully absorbed in his presence. Both are in the same place with the same Lord, but their responses are miles apart. Isn't it interesting that me and you can go to the same church, sit in the same service, sing the same songs, listen to the same message, but yet walk away with two totally different experiences. One person might be moved to tears, experiencing deep peace, healing, and freedom, while the other one is just simply enjoying uh, good music and the flow of a service. One person leaves refreshed and strengthened and transformed while the other leaves having taken notes as if they sat through a well-polished TED talk. It's the same external environment, but yet one encounters the living God and the other one just attends an event. Why, why is that? Why is that because one truly, one is truly present with God and the other one is just going through the motions? Think about it. One person is singing about God while one person is singing to God. Come on. One person hears someone speaking uh, about God, but one hears God speak. One is sitting at the feet of Jesus while one is distracted and worried about many things. The difference between observing and engaging is do you know Jesus or do you know about Jesus? This is exactly what's happening here in our text with Mary and Martha. Martha was so busy doing for Jesus that she missed the chance to be with Jesus. She was anxious and distracted by many things, good things no doubt, but uh, she missed the most important thing. Yeah. And Mary, on the other hand, chose the good portion, sitting at his feet, focused on his presence and drinking in his words. We see in verse 39, you can put the verse back up at Luke 10, verse 39, and it says, and uh, she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. See, serving here wasn't the issue. The text said that she was distracted with serving. Distracted is the key word. The issue was her focus and her priority. She ele elevated doing for God above being with God. Yeah, 
And so it can be easy to slip into this mentality. We, we can uh, easily uh, feel like, feel good if we can make Christianity a checklist. Did I pray this morning? Did, did I uh, serve um, on the kids' ministry? Did I host? Did I pray, my, uh, pray uh, and read my Bible? Did I go to small group? We can use those uh, checklist items as a way to gauge or even negotiate with God. Well... I know I haven't really spent time with God, but, you know, I'm at church today. That's got to make up for something. And, and we then begin to use our behavior as a way to um, uh, feel better about the lack of intimacy that we have with the Lord. But see, the checklist Christianity is ultimately saying, God, your cross is not enough to save and your spirit alone is not enough to sanctify. A checklist has an end. But the last time I checked, the gift of the gospel is eternal life. See, see, a checklist can be compartmentalized, but yet the offer of him being Savior and Lord is over your whole life. A checklist emphasizes your doing, but Christ said, I've done it already. A checklist is transactional, whereas the gospel message is relational. And a checklist is duty, but the gospel is delight. Deuteronomy uh, 28, God is uh, speaking to the people of Israel and he says this to them. Because you did not serve the Lord your God with joyfulness and gladness of heart because of the abundance of all things, therefore you shall serve your enemies whom the Lord will send against you in hunger and thirst and nakedness and lacking everything. See, the Lord is serious about your delight. You're, the Lord is serious in how you serve him. It's not just what you do, but how you do it. Yes. See, this is a physical in the Old Testament representation of what is uh, to come in the New Testament. Really, what the Lord is saying, he's saying this is a picture that if you just serve God out of duty and you serve God out of without joy or gladness, that is the same thing as it is to be enslaved. Doing for God minus relational intimacy, you'll get death. Yeah. But if the doing comes out of relational intimacy, that's life. So imagine this. Imagine if you came up to me and you asked me, hey, Michael, how, how's your marriage going? And I go, that's a good question. Well, I filled up her tank with gas this week and I made her coffee. And I did say I love you. And then she, she didn't even have to ask me, but I told her why. You'll, you'll kind of be like, oh, that's not what I asked. I wasn't asking for all that. Like if I respond, if I respond to a relational question with things that I do, there is a big disconnect I'm not asking, you're not asking me what I did. You're asking me, how are we? In the same way, in the same way that because you, you could do the same thing for, for my wife. Uh, you could fill her tank with gas. We'd be much appreciated. Anybody want to do that? Hallelujah. You could also make her coffee in the morning. Um, don't know how you would get in the house and it, it just logistics don't quite work out, but you could. You could even go as far as to say you love her and tell her why. Now, I would have questions depending on who you are and what you're saying. <laughs> but you could do those things. Those things that you do don't make you her husband. Come on. But because I'm her husband, yeah, go. I'm going to want to bring her coffee in the morning because I, like, I know she likes coffee. Now, now, if she didn't like coffee and I brought her coffee, right, then there would be a disconnect. Even though the, the thing that I'm doing is out of a heart's posture, I don't know her. So, so many of us, we, we, get, we can get caught up in doing things that God never asked you to do. Come on. And you're under the auspice of trying to please him, but he didn't ask for that. He didn't ask for sacrifice, but he asked for a broken and contrite heart. So in the same way, you doing a bunch of things don't make you in great relationship with God. But if you're in great relationship with God, there will be looking like things that you are doing. 
culture has ingrained in us that we have to do something to have something. Yeah. Yet the gospel, Christ did something that, so that we can be. Our doing must flow out of what has already been done. His sacrifice on the cross. This is where the difference lies. It's where is your heart lie? Are we like Martha so caught up in the busyness of life that even the good things, we miss what's truly essential? Or are we like Mary who understands that the only thing that truly matters is being with Jesus? We can be in the same physical space as others, even in a place where God is moving, but still miss an encounter. It's not about what's happening around us, but what's happening in us. The question is, are we positioning our heart to receive and experience what God has for us in his presence? Are we distracted with many other things? Are we making space to have our full attention to the glory and the weight of who he is? Or are we just kind of going through the motions? As we enter verse 39... It says that Mary is the one Luke describes as sitting at the feet of Jesus and listening to his teaching. I love the fact that Mary is identified by her position with Jesus. I, I, I don't need uh, to, for you to know that I'm from Fresno. I don't need by the end of my life that I worked at Berkeley High or I was on staff at Mission. At the end of my time, uh, though those things are great, like being married to Caroline, one of the best things that has ever happened to me. All those things are great if I get to be a father or not, if I get to see grandkids or not by the length of my time. If uh, you can X, Y, Z it down, but if I can be described as that was a man who set by Jesus' feet, I'll be all right. I, I don't know about you, but I want to be known as someone who sits at the feet of Jesus. And so here we see that Mary is identified by the fact of who she's sitting under. And we hear, sat at the Lord's feet, and we probably just picture a little kid coming to sit down for carpet time for story. But that's not what's in full view. And so we're going to look at how this phrase is used in other scriptures to give us a fuller context. So if we're going to back it up, somebody say back it up. Back it up. We're going to back it up to Luke 8. Luke chapter 8, verse 27. It says, when Jesus had stepped out on land, there met him a man from the city who had demons. For a long time, he had worn no clothes. He had not lived in the house, but among the tombs. He was living in the graveyard, somebody. And when he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and said with a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, do not torment me. For I had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many a time it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and sat shackles, but he would break the bonds and would be driven by the demon into the desert. Now I want you to drop down. We're going to drop down to verse 35. After he has an encounter with Jesus, I'll kind of paraphrase to get us to the verse. Jesus um, uh, speaks to uh, the man and says, what is your name? And he says, Legion, for I am many. And then he says, come out. And, you know, then he goes into the pigs, the pigs over the, you know, it's a great read. You should read it. Um, <laughs> then we get down to verse 35. And he says, then the people went out to see what had happened. And they came to Jesus and found the man whom the demons had gone. And look what it says, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid because you start messing with people's money, they get afraid. You know, that was their livestock that now all of a sudden they said, we did, Jesus, we don't have nothing to do with you. You start, you acting with my money, you acting funny. So we have this demon-possessed man who has lost his mind, has no clothing, lives in the tombs among the dead, was shackled and chained, chained, lost his identity. He didn't even have a name anymore because of the bondage that he was under. You asked him what his name and he identified with what had got him. And some, some of you are here today. If I asked you your name, maybe something would come up and say alcohol. 
Maybe if I ask you your name, you, you, you might say gambling. You, if I ask you your name, maybe, maybe because you're afraid of people knowing all of you, that the very thing that has you bound is the thing that you want to, is causing you to identify with the most. But if you just sit at Jesus' feet, well, watch what happens. So his outward condition mir- mirrors really his inner turmoil, turmoil mentally broken, isolated from society, stripped of his identity and dignity. He embodies the chaos and the bondage of sin and evil that can bring into life. But then something remarkable happens, an encounter with Jesus. When the people of the town came to see him after his deliverance and found him transformed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, fully clothed and in his right mind, the powerful contrast speaks more than just a physical healing. It reveals a complete restoration of his soul. No longer a slave to the demonic forces, the man is now in a place of peace, order, and sanity. His chains are gone and torment has ended. The image of him sitting at the feet of Jesus is rich in meaning. In the cultural context of the time, we see sitting at someone's feet was actually an expression of learning. Uh, Paul, the apostle Paul will go on to say in Philippians chapter 3, he says, I sat at the feet of Gamaliel, which was a rabbi, and to sit at his feet, what he was doing, Paul was saying, I, I was a disciple of him. I sat under his teachings and I followed him and I uh, was following him. And so here we see that to sit at someone's feet is an expression of learning, discipleship, and submission. It shows that the man wasn't just moved from um, uh, a life of chaos to one that was obedient and was devoted. And we see here that this posture isn't just about being physically near Jesus, but it represents a heart that is now surrendered to Jesus. So when the offer on the table is come and sit at Jesus' feet, it's not come to church and raise your hand and I sit at Jesus' feet. It's are you listening to his words because you're clinging to them just as Peter said. He says, Peter, Peter, after Jesus uh, has a hard teaching and everybody leaves and Jesus tells the disciples, are you going to leave too? Peter said, no, no, no. Where are we to go? You're the only ones with the words of eternal life. To cling on to Jesus' teaching is to sit at his feet. The man has placed himself under the authority of Christ, and under the authority of Christ, he saw freedom. So sitting at Jesus' feet, under his teaching, under his authority, no longer was he under the authority of what had him bound. This brings true freedom, healing, and identity. But notice, if you think about somebody sitting, and I'm not going to go all the way to the floor because I don't know, I'm going to get up, but you know, if I'm sitting on the ground, I got to get low. And um, I get low, I got to look up to whoever's talking. And I want you to imagine sitting at the feet of Jesus. Some of you have a hard time sitting because you're not willing to get low enough. You're not willing to be humble. You're not willing to confess. You're not willing to see, to sit yourself down that maybe you don't have it all under control. Maybe you don't know what's best for your life. And not only to get in a lowly posture because there's a difference between being, having a self pity party and being humble. It's, it all determines where you look. I'm not low looking at myself pitying, but I'm low looking up at my Jesus. So it's where you're posturing yourself and where you are looking all determines how you are sitting at the feet of Jesus. And so sitting at the feet of Jesus is too where we'll find wholeness. It's a place of peace where the storms of life are calmed. It's a place of freedom where the chains are broken. This position is not one of weakness, but of strength. Because it recognizes Jesus as Lord. It acknowledges that all power and authority belongs to him. In submitting to him, we are made whole just as he was. And so that is the invitation. To sit at the feet of Jesus. Now, as I'm talking about an invitation, an invitation from Jesus through this gospel account in Luke, Imagine this, 
imagine you got a text from an unknown number, all right? First off, it's like, who this? Now, let's say the text said, hey, let's grab lunch soon. You even more worried, like, who is this? Who would no want to have lunch with me? How you respond to that invitation all depends on who sent you that text message. Because if, if it was your ex, you like, new number, who this? Or blocked, right? right and we, we're not going to go down that route. If maybe, let's say it's a good friend from, from college. You, you know, they changed their phone number, what have you. And um, because you saw them on social media and things like that, you know, they probably most likely going to sell you something. So you're like... <laughs> You know, we all got some of them friends who circle back around <laughs> and ask, can I have a meeting with you? So you're like, well, I'm pretty busy this week as you're sitting on your couch. Um, I'm just booked. I, I don't know. I don't know. And they're like, well, I'll be here a few days while uh, those, those exact dates, I'm not going to be able to make it. That doesn't quite work out. But uh, I'm... Then, then, like, this is truly a, a good friend, but somehow after the phone, you didn't have the number saved, whatever. It's like, oh, yeah, here are some dates that are flexible. Now, I, I don't know who it is for you all, but um, uh, what type of person would cause this response? Um, but um, I was thinking, I was like, Joe, Joe, you love you some LeBron James. <laughs> yeah. Now, what if I told you that LeBron James said, hey, um, just trying to connect with some Bay Area basketball coaches, and I want to have lunch with you. I don't care how you feeling. You calling off work. You're not coming in. You're going to make sure it don't matter because of Sue who sent the invitation. Like, this is like a once-in-a-time opportunity. You're not like, hey, man, I'm just kind of busy. I don't know. You, that's not the kind of response you're going to have because of the weight of who sent you the text message. Y'all not responding to this invitation rightly. And maybe it's because the weight and the irresistibility of the invitation is because you don't know who's inviting you. So let me read you his bio. He's the God who spoke the entire universe into existence. The one who is all powerful and all knowing. He's the creator of all things from the vast galaxies to the intricate details of the human soul. He set the stars in place, calling each one by name. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. He's eternal, having no beginning and no end, existing beyond space and time, yet intimately involved in every single moment of our lives. He's omniscient, knowing not only everything that exists, but the thoughts and the intentions of every human heart. Nothing is hidden from his sight. His wisdom is unsearchable, far beyond human understanding. He, and he orchestrates all things according to his perfect plan. He is sovereign over all creation, ruling and reigning with absolute authority. No force, no power, no person can thwart his plan. He raises up kings and brings them down. He directs the courses of nations, and he is the true judge of the world. His love covers a multitude of sins. It's steadfast, unfailing, and eternal. He's a mighty warrior fighting for his people, yet he's also a God of peace, bringing calm to the storm and speaking stillness into the chaos of our lives. He's the healer, yeah. binding up the brokenhearted and healing the wounds of his people. His justice is perfect. One day he will right every single wrong, yet his grace is abundant, offering forgiveness to us all if we turn in repentance to him. He is both the lion and the lamb, the mighty king and the humble savior who gave his life to redeem us. In yeah. all these things, God is utterly unchanging. The same yesterday, today, and forever. His purposes stand. His glory will be revealed across the whole earth. He is Alpha and he is Omega. He's the beginning and he is the end. The one who holds all things in his hands. That's the one who's inviting you to come and sit at his feet. How can you resist that invitation? How could you say no? 
to the living God who is offering you, who knows all, sees all. And so to sit at his feet means to rest in his presence. To sit at his feet means to trust that he's everything under control. To sit at his feet means to be fully known, your good, your bad, and the ugly, and yet to be eternally loved all the same. To sit at his feet means to be fully known and to experience the fullness of his joy. To sit at his feet means that your mind is renewed and restored, breaking free from bondage of every mental health struggle. To sit at his feet, it's mean to be free from the power, penalty, and one day the presence of sin. To sit at his feet is to be empowered to live a spirit-filled life so that others may know the richness of the intimacy of our God. And verse 40, we go back to the text, and it says, Martha was distracted with much serving, but she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. Isn't it interesting when we elevate doing for God above being with God, we become, become really critical of others. The shift, the shift focuses from Jesus to, to the people that's at his feet because you're not there. Then you become the standard of what needs to happen. That's when preference starts getting in the way. Martha was like, uh, 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 this is not how we do things. Come on, Mar Mary, come on. Come on, get up here. We need to, be, we need to help, help me. Don't you see all that I'm doing? And in the same way, that's, that's the kind of spirit when we forget to stay submitted and sitting and resting at Jesus' feet, then we, then we can start to allow preference. Well, that song was too loud. I don't, I don't, that's not how we should do that. But last time I checked, that song wasn't about you. And so I, that you just, you complaining the whole time and you just miss an opportunity to be with your God. Whether I turned it up or turned it low, he's still good. I don't, that's not how, that's not how small groups should be ran. Are you the one who built the church? Are you the one who died for community? We, it's not that we, we don't strive for biblical excellence, but if we start to shift our preference over his presence, then that's an issue. Martha said, forget the presence of Jesus. I need you to come and serve with me because the priority is be doing for Jesus and not being with Jesus. And I love this, that when you're sitting at the feet of Jesus, Mary didn't have to defend herself. Jesus spoke all for her and said, Martha, Martha, it, it, if you knew the good portion that Mary has chosen, basically he says, you would have chosen this too. And the invitation is yet all the same. The Martha, Martha, as he repeats himself twice, is really a love letter in a, in a way to, to Martha. It's like, Martha, Martha, you're anxious and troubled about many things. Come choose the good portion. And so how do you choose the good portion? How, how do you sit how do you wrestle with the, the, the things that you have to do in your life, the, 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 the kids that are running crazy, the, the business that you just opened, uh, the, the, the schooling uh, that, that you've started? Like, how do you balance all of these things? Though they're good things, Jesus said only one thing is necessary. And so I want to give you a practical tool, and I'll have the worship team come up. I want to give you a practical tool of what it could look like to, to really just dwell at, at Jesus' feet. And this practical tool is not, you know, it don't sound all that fancy. And it's like, oh, well, no, duh, Michael. But it's a good reminder. Praying scripture. Praying scripture. Now, the reason why I, I wanted to highlight this is because in these five verses in Luke, Luke doesn't record any words from Mary. So when we consider what she received as the good portion, we are left with only what Jesus said. Going back to verse 39, it makes it clear. Mary sat at his feet and, somebody say and, and. listened to his teaching. And so often we fill our time sitting at Jesus' feet by talking to him rather than listening what he has to say. 
See, see, he knows about your past, but do you know about his plan? He, he, he knows about your hurt, but do you know about his healing? He, he knows about your problem, but do you know about his power? He, he knows about your grief, but do you know about his grace? He knows about your mistake, but, but do you know of his mercy? He knows of your failure, but do you, do you really know his forgiveness? It is when you sit at the feet of Jesus and you listen to what he has to say that you become more aware of the promises of God, the faithfulness of God, the mercy of God, the plan of God, the purposes of God, the strength of God, the love of God. One of the best ways to level up your prayer life sitting at the feet of Jesus is through praying scripture. What makes it hard to pray is sometimes you don't know who you're talking to. And I, 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 I hope today you're like, I, I'm getting, I want a better sense of who Jesus is. Well, the only way you're going to really know who he is is by listening to what he has to say. And he's already made it plain to us in, in his word of like, this is what, who I am. And and how are you to know me if you don't know my word? Some of us, it's hard to pray because we don't know what to pray for. But yet his word reveals his heart, reveals of how we should pray uh, to him. And then a lot of times we don't believe that we have uh, the power of our prayer. That it doesn't matter. But 1 John uh, 5, 14, let me encourage you with this. And this is the confidence that we have toward him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Scripture is the greatest tangible thing that we have to help us in our prayers. One, if you're taking notes, this is where we'll end. Reason number one, the word of God informs our faith of who God is, right? Because it's hard to talk to someone you don't know. Reason number two, the word of God gives us language for what we need to pray for. I don't know what to pray for. God in his word reveals his desires, his heart's plan, how he's working in and through you. That will fuel how to pray. And then three, the word of God gives us promises of God that have been paid in full by the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. It would be crazy to think that if I went to a restaurant and I sat down, I said, where's my food? Well, you didn't order anything. And, and I wasn't planning to pay. It would be really odd for me to expect a meal to be given to me. But if, especially if I've already paid for the meal, there's the hope and an assurance that I'm gonna get what's coming, what, what's been ordered. In the same way, when we come to God with his word, he's already paid the full price on the cross for what we pray for, if we pray according to his uh, uh, will, because he's already paid the price for it. And so we can have the assurance of coming to him because he's already paid the price. And God, we're saying thank you because you, God, know uh, all things. And so it's coming to him with a humble posture of like, God, I don't know what to pray, but God, you revealed it. And so maybe tonight, I just want to encourage you that as you open up your word, that you would ask him, I'm going to give you four, four questions to ask the text. What does the scripture show us about God the Father, God the Son, and the Spirit so we can worship him? What does the scripture show us about what God has done so we can praise him? And what does the scripture show us about God's promises so we can express faith in him? And what does the scripture show us about God's will or desire so we can cry out for help and confess? To worship him, to praise him, we're reminded of his promises and to confess that if we go to his word, that'll fuel your prayer. 
And so maybe you're here tonight with every head bowed and eye closed. Maybe you don't know this Jesus that I've been talking about. Like you, you've heard about him, but you want to know that you know that you know that you know him. Well, I pray that, that you would hear his voice tonight, knowing that you can have assurance of a relationship with him, that the invitation is open, that the, the Lord is knocking on your heart. But the Bible says that you, you've got to make a decision. There, there, you have to place your faith. You have to position yourselves to sit at his feet. And, and maybe you're here tonight and you're like, I want to do that for the first time. I, I want to sit at Jesus' feet. I want to surrender my life to him. If that's you, I, I want to know who I'm praying for. So on count of three, would you just raise your hand? I want a relationship with Jesus. One, two, three. Three, God sees that hand and God sees that hand. I'm in need of a savior. Lord, I repent of trying to be in control of my own life. You are the only one that de deserves to be Lord over my life. I submit to you today. I come to sit at your feet. My life is yours. In Jesus' mighty name I pray, amen.